Hey, hello everybody, Scott Golding here with the Pro Wrestling Logic YouTube channel and welcome to those of you who are new. We've got over 1,200 audios available for your listening pleasure. Old school, new school, territory and uh, WCW, WWE stuff, plus modern day stuff if you're into that as well. Uh, this is the WCW Saturday Night Series, August 1st, 1992. Bill Watts is out after a promo hyping the run between... Uh, Steve Austin and Ricky Steamboat, uh, their feud seems to heat up here. Watts basically says he doesn't like getting into lots of chaos, but he will. He's going to send out fines when necessary. Brian Pillman and Sergeant Buddy Lee Parker is your opening match. Not exactly something to write home about. Pillman, of course, going back after uh, Brad Armstrong, who is the light heavyweight champion at this point, having defeated... Jushin Thunder Liger. Pillman stays on the arm for the majority of the beginning piece of the match. Uh, Sergeant Buddy Lee Parker late, later becomes known simply as Sarge and is the head trainer at the power plant. So, worthwhile guy to know. Anyway, hip toss by Pillman after working the arm for several minutes. Drop kick by Pillman, who doesn't want to seem to quit, is ultimately, um, you know, goes to the outside, uh, dives over the top a little bit, cannot get. Uh, cannot use the top rope maneuvers, but does the drop kick from the second rope on the inside and gets the victory. Uh, endorses Sting in, and going back at Vader and mentions that he wants to face off against uh, Brad Armstrong in the not too distant future. Scotty Flamingo, otherwise known as Raven and the Taylor Made Man, otherwise known as Terry Taylor, are your next people up here. Uh, Marcus Bagwell and the Z-Man Tom Zink are their opponents. Interesting combination just because of the difference in, I guess you'd say, space and time. Of course, Raven, a.k.a. Flamingo, and um, Bagwell are basically from the same um, gene pool in terms of where they came from, which is Global Wrestling Federation, not too terribly long before this, probably less than a year before. Zinc and Bagwell make for an interesting team. Match is relatively simple. Uh, the heels do the majority of the takeover, including uh, just arm bars, arm locks, and the likes uh, by Bagwell and Flamingo. Ta tag off to Zinc. Zinc comes in via the second rope with an elbow, dro uh, elbow drop onto the arm. Cut off by Flamingo, who doesn't seem to want to quit. Beautiful drop kick right under the chin of Bagwell by Flamingo. Flamingo stays in for mo more than his fair share of the match. Of course, he goes into the nature of uh, taking a good bit of punishment, including some drop kicks under the chin, and ultimately um, basic stuff there. Um, you know, uh, double Greco-Roman knuckle lock type stuff. Taylor comes in with that. Taylor overpowers him for a little bit, but cheats along the way to get there from here. Um, Bagwell doesn't seem terribly impressed with that. Taylor cuts him off, hits uh, a couple of knees to the midsection, and some shots. We go back into the ring, and um, Zinc comes back in, this time with Flamingo. Cinching up for several minutes on a... Um, wrist lock and for the most part the battle over the wrist lock and hammer lock is the majority of the battle here. Uh, Taylor comes back in, gets caught with a cross body by Zinc from the second rope. Modified almost looks like an enziguri by Zinc there. Doesn't get all he wants but does get nearly enough to have caused uh, Taylor to bail out of the ring match continues after they after the heels spend a good bit of time on the floor liking this match just because it's got good wrestling to it and it's got quite a bit of uh, damage uh, neck breaker by Flamingo who doesn't seem to want to back down too terribly much um, and then we see Taylor dropping the knee on the arm and wrist of his opponent 
They go back and forth again for several more minutes. Zink in on the receiving end does a good bit of punishment. Couple of comebacks, but nothing major. And then it's amazing to me that Zink, who a lot of people take for granted, actually has the majority of the match. Uh, your baby faces do eventually get the victory here, which I think for the majority of the match, that would not have been the expectation. Um, but, you know, <coughs> you know, that's just the way it is. Um, all four guys in the ring right before that cut, cut off a super style maneuver. And uh, Bagwell gets the victory for the team. Bagwell getting pushed pretty heavy. It's easy to see that they have, they have plans for him in the future. Johnny B. Bad basically says he's going to defeat Vader if given the opportunity at the Omni coming up. Then we go to a Barbarian squash match. To think that the Barbarian, by the end of the year, is challenging for the heavyweight title with Ron Simmons is interesting. I mean, this is a squash, so it's very one-sided. Punch, kick, punch, kick, really basic stuff. The enhancement talent doesn't get much more than maybe a couple of punches off. Maybe an offensive maneuver, chops and punch, <coughs> punches and kicks by uh, um, the Barbarian, who does not seem to want to take a backward step. He actually hits a press slam and drops the guy right down and hits a Mafia-style kick, one, two, three. Then we go to the locker room area and a brawl. Um, Rick Rude says he wants a title shot. Brawl between Sting and Vader. Fines handed it, handed it out by um, Eric. Not Eric Watts. Bill Watts. Uh, Rude says he should be the number one contender. Demands to be such. <coughs> excuse me. Be such. And Rude is tired of being undervalued as the number one contender. And as the U.S. champion. Watts takes this under advisement and continues to be a guy who is uh, pretty continual with that process. Cactus, uh, Jack is also part of the Barbarians entourage eventually, but does not uh, get that opportunity here. Jimmy Garvin comes into the ring for his next match. Odd that Garvin is used so much here because it doesn't really seem like they have a major plan for him, but I guess they brought him back and figured they had to do something with him, and they continue to do that. For about another year and a half, I think he leaves in the in the winter uh, months of 1994. Um, then we see the new tag team champions, Williams and Gordy, out there. Uh, they are here and certainly ready to go. Dr. Death Steve Williams, of course, as one half of the tag team champions, goes right at Jimmy Garvin. Uh, Garvin does get side headlock takeovers on his opponent a little bit. Not exactly the type of match one would expect. Williams does power down, but Garvin is basically put in the babyface role, getting roll-ups and the like. Kicks and punches, though, and dominant offensive maneuvers, including but not limited to modified abdominal stretches and other things. Hooked in by Williams, who almost gets a modified stump puller at one point in the middle of the contest and continues to be a guy. Who wants to keep going towards uh, finishing this? The awkwardness of the match does kind of continue in the sense that they never really get into a major flow. Every time um, it looks like Garvin's going to get a little bit of a comeback, it lasts for less than 60 seconds, does not last long at all. And uh, whether it be punches, kicks, and chops, or uh, an eventual Oklahoma-style stampede, uh, Williams is dominant and continues the victory throughout. Then we see a promo with the tag team champions, talk of them being the best team in the world, and basically, Terry Gordy admits or intimates that, in fact, the only ones that can beat Vader is... Uh, ultimately going to be one of them. Uh, then we see the Steiners in an enhancement match, Rick and Scott Steiner, who are probably one of the biggest, certainly the biggest tag team mainstay in WCW at this point. Maybe it's one of the top, uh, two of the top five mainstay baby faces in the entire territory. Scott Steiner squaring off with his adversary. 
bouncing him around before Rick comes in with a hard clothesline, Steiner line style maneuver. Uh, the nature of the match continues, and eventually Scott Steiner hits a Frankensteiner on one of the uh, enhancement talents, and there we go. Cactus Jack basically comes out, says he wants to get, to get his hands on Ricky Steamboat, something he has intimated before in previous weeks. He also intimates that Vader should give him a shot because he's one of the few that deserves it, and we begin to see the tease for that, which doesn't come about until probably spring of 93, but we're talking about it anyway. Um, anyhow, uh, Van Hammer comes out, for his enhancement match. Van Hammer in WCW doesn't really do a heck of a lot. Uh, Chris Sullivan is his enhancement uh, uh, challenger here. Doesn't really get too much. Sullivan bounces off his adversary quite a few times before finally getting a uh, kick or two to the midsection. Van Hammer looks good but is not that great. Hits a uh, leaping leg drop across the middle and finally does get a victory in quick order. Notice they keep the Van Hammer matches short because he can't go long. Then there is a, a long-term promo uh, after a slingshot suplex, almost the old Tully Blanchard finish is what wins it for um, is what wins it for um, Van Hammer. Then we see about a six or seven minute Promo video with Ron Simmons football footage and an interview with Tony Schiavone. Talks about him being retired early as an All-American and retiring his jersey. Talks about being a fighting champion and wanting to fight for the people, fight for the fans. Talks about Vader and, and Sting and all the other challengers that are to come. This is a decent sit-down sit down piece. Um, Nikita Koloff... <coughs> Then talks about uh, facing Rick Rude eventually for the uh, U.S. Championship in a couple of weeks at the Omni in Atlanta. Of course, the Omni, the major, uh, I guess you'd say house show run, kind of like the WCW version of Madison Square Garden, for lack of a better term. Then an enhancement match as Vader faces off against Jim Nash, not to be confused with Kevin. Uh, in an enha <coughs> enhancement match, excuse me, everyone says, why don't you edit these? Because, honestly, I don't want to redo, um, you know, 15, 20 minutes of stuff for a cough here and there. Plus, honestly, we're human. We cough. We sneeze. It happens. Um, and I, I hate people that over-edit. Anyhow, Vader hits a few short clotheslines, followed by the power bomb, and gets the victory. I mean, I don't quite understand having him in a squash match as a champion, um, you know, it it kind of is pointless and TV filler. Uh, Sting basically says he wants to kick Vader's booty. Sting looks a little, a little weak here, uh, you know, in a follow-up promo. But then we go to our predominant main event, and they've got about 20, 21, 22 minutes there. Um, Steve Austin with the television championship against Ricky Steamboat. Beautiful match. Uh, you can see so much of Austin and what he would become, even in this contest. Uh, lots of back and forth. Uh, Steamboat is in control early. Austin tries to break down the body. Steamboat pulls on, puts on a, a uh, front face lock, kind of runs through it, and again, there you go. Uh, hard shots along the way, and... Um, there's, there's some shots there as Steamboat puts on an arm bar, tries to slow the match down. Obviously, Paul Heyman, a.k.a. Paulie Dangerously at this time, as he is known, uh, is there with his television champion. Uh, an attempted gut wrench suplex that turns into a roll-up. Steamboat getting several roll-ups and the deep arm drags that he is so known for. Breaks the match down, stays on the arm, works the arm for several minutes, Steamboat not wanting to give up any unnecessary leverage. Actually does a bridging uh, hammerlock at one point. Stays on for several minutes as he continues to, you know, kind of put things forward. Works the arm, sends, the, sends Austin arm first and shoulder first into the buckle. Austin fights back eventually. Uh, does get a bit of a... 
reprieve as he begins to brawl with about 10 minutes left in the television program. Austin hits some decent-looking strikes by 1992 standards. Probably wouldn't be decent today, but today there's so much that's not decent, those strikes still look more credible than half of what people do with the MMA strikes that land 12 in a row, and then, you know, nobody even remotely sells them. Um, anyway, Austin goes for what looks like a seated abdominal stretch, doesn't really get it on because he doesn't know where he's going. You can see some of the uh, losses, I guess you'd say, in terms of experience. Austin finally does place the abdominal stretch on. Both guys come back to a vertical base relatively quickly. Steamboat mounts a comeback with some chops and basic stuff. You see that uh, both guys are, I wouldn't say getting tired, but they're showing battle weary, which is good. Match evolves, backdrop by Steamboat. And Steamboat wants to get any advantage he can. Full body scissors by uh, Austin and almost like a pass of the guard type maneuver. Meanwhile, we continue to see Steamboat rain down shot after shot. Cut off by Austin. Austin sends the man back up. Steamboat comes back down with a couple of shots along the way. Um, there is the use of a foreign object that Austin brings into the ring through Heyman, but uh, Steamboat gets caught with it, gets disqualified in the process of it, and there is your victor in Steve Austin. In any event, we'll be back with more right after this.